Can I ever tell you, by the way, I stood next to um, <laughs> Stuart Pearce in the loo? Stuart Pearce. That could be a whole subject of itself, couldn't it, really? What Famous was, people you've been, you, you've what, stood next to in the gents. What was his nickname? Wasn't it like the bulldog? Psycho. Or? Psycho. That was it. Yeah, we we'll yeah. want to sit next to him in the toilet. Well, I, I didn't know what to say to him. I knew it was Psycho because I'd seen him in the, in the pub where we were eating. And I wanted to say, that goal you scored. And made, but he, he probably gets that all the time, doesn't he? Yeah. What would you say next to? I just, we, uh, I just grunted a bit. All right, I probably wouldn't have said. Remember that time you missed that penalty? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> I also stood next to Joe Busink in the uh, in the gents as well, the the wedding photographer. Hmm. I think I'd rather sit next to stand. Well, it wasn't nobody sitting. sit next no, to. You, no, that no, would be odd. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was standing. Yeah. I had a bit of a conversation with him. Mm. I, don't, I can't remember what it was. About. Have you ever stood next to anybody? Um, uh, I stood next to Tom Russell. Nobody knows who Tom Russell is. Though. Tom Russell. He's a country and western singer. <laughs> Back on country and the western. Fuji cast. Welcome to the Country and Western Fuji Cast Show. Episode uh, ep- uh, yeehaw, episode eight. It is episode eight. Isn't it is, it? I'm going to have to keep up with the episode uh, the episode numbers. Um, thank you very much for your your questions. As always, um, if you send them in, please, it's to click at fujicast.co.uk. I didn't say that enough last week. And and uh, questions Absolutely. are the lifeblood of the show. Absolutely. So you do need to keep send them, them in. Otherwise, it's going to be um, it's going to be an hour of us talking about famous people we've stood next to in the gents. So make sure you you do send them in today. And um, we've got a really really special um, interview, but. You recorded this years ago, didn't you? Yeah, long, long time ago. Long time ago. It was, well, it must be four, five years ago, maybe. I don't know. Really? So, I remember you going to record it. That can't be four years. Yeah. So, uh, interestingly, the, we have this email somewhere, don't we? Yeah. Um, well, let me, um, let me, let me just pop it up a second. I'll pop the email up. This is a professional um, podcast. There we go. We are. So, um, I literally said to Neil last week that uh, I have rediscovered the audio interview I did with Robin Revillius, who is James Revillius' That's wife. Right, yeah. And you know, James Rovidius is a uh, UK photographer. Many of you would have heard of him. Many of you will not have heard of him. Um, he is, he, unfortunately, he's dead now, but his, his black and white documentary photography Stunning. of North, and, North Devon life yeah. is amazing. And uh, I encourage everybody to, to check out the work. And the uh, the body of work that he's left behind, behind is, is, is a legacy and an archive. And literally, I, I mentioned to Neil that I had that. And uh, about five minutes later, <laughs> serendipity. Mm. On I know, steroids. I know. Uh, Simon Picard emailed with uh, a couple of other kind of questions, and, and part of it in his email was, "I've learned from Kevin's resource at f16.clip that he interviewed Robin Revillius, James's widow, back in 2014." Like Question do, do, mark. Do, 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 mm. I wonder if this might make an interesting segment. And so uh, today, well, I've dug it out. Yeah. I've found it. I've blown the cobwebs off it. <laughs> um, and it's actually an interview I did for Professional Photographer magazine um, back in the day when I was writing a monthly column for them. Yeah. And uh, the magazine went belly up shortly after I recorded the interview, so it never got published. And um, So yeah, you, so, uh, as an audience on the Fujicast, are the first people to ever hear this. World exclusive. It is. Yeah, world exclusive. So before we get to the interview, if you're unaware of James's stuff... Uh, Leica, shooter, beautiful photography, black and white, mm. um, storyteller, documentarian. Great. Love it. What was she like? Beautiful. A very, very um, quiet, uh, unassuming lady. Their house uh, was, um, I mean, for me, bearing in mind I've got all of the books, I've seen, you know, there was a, uh, a BBC documentary. You're without James damn fan. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm unashamed. I'm, I'm an unashamed. So I went down to their house, and I walked in, and you know she she handed me the camera he's using, which is all um, battered to bits and has got bits of frying pan on top for reflectors and everything. <laughs> all of the prints that are scattered all over the house. The I sat in the armchair that he sat. I went into the room that he no did way. his printing in. Uh, she made me soup. Uh, you know, she was, I think the first thing she said to me was, "Would you like a cup of tea?" Uh, oh yeah, that's was, on the interview. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, and, I, I heard that. And well, it's not on the interview; it's on the tape. It's on the yeah. it's on the recording. And I was like, "This is, you know, this 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 kind of stuff yeah. does not happen to uh, to lads from Newport." You know, it's like a real real. And bearing in mind, this is four or five years ago, whatever it was. Did, um, Simon said two thousand and fourteen, so maybe four four years ago. Yeah, um, and yeah, I mean, she was beautiful. And I think subsequently, she has written a biography of James since that review. Yeah, um, and uh, I think. Think that 
you know some of the other stuff that you know we've got a corner of England um, the heart of the country all of those things an English eye down the deep uh, lanes down the deep lanes and yeah so Robin has written a book Robin the wife has written a book called James Ravidius A Life um, and I actually don't have that so I think I must get that I, lo- I love what Simon says he, he goes on in, in his question to you where, where he's suggesting that we have um, this on a future podcast mm. which is today mm-hmm. um he said, I, my project for 2019 is to start to photograph as many scenes as possible that James Revillius photographed during the years 73 to 89, uh, not only to show how much has changed, but to celebrate how much has stayed the same. I yeah. think that's a really nice concept. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Really nice. Great idea. Good stuff. Thanks, Simon. So that's coming up in the show, right? You can go You can go first with the questions then this week. Okay, questions, questions. Right, Albert Albert Palmer, uh, fellow uh, wedding photographer. Very good one. Very, very, very good one. Uh, from my neck of the woods, in fact, I think. Mm. Kind of Bristol direction. Blah, blah, blah. You mentioned something, something, something. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts on whether you think there is a lower skill set required to photograph weddings and now you use mirrorless cameras. Mm. Um, presumably, you being us, we, the, the industry. It's not accusational. Um, no, yeah. Yeah, uh, I also started around 10 years ago and have seen quite a shift in the technology. Whilst I use a different camera brand, I no longer use a lot of technical skills I learned when I started. With mirrorless, I don't need to expose as I can see the EVF. The camera focuses for me on the head eye. I can even take 6, 10, 20 frames a second in silence and pick the best one so I don't need to anticipate the moment. We have auto ISO, in-camera stabilisation, and so taking good photos is so much easier these days. Yeah. He's right. Mm. Absolutely right. However, what I would caveat that with is that, you know, the whole idea, I personally think that I still need to know how to expose. Um, Yes, I can see it in the EVF and that will help me to get the exposure right. But I still need to understand that, you know, if I'm going into the darker areas, the ISO needs to change or shutter speed, blah, 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 etc. The camera focuses for me on the head eye. Mm, Yeah, to a certain extent, although um, I think that Albert uses sony uh we don't have that ability well actually by the time this podcast comes out we might have had the xt3 firmware update where you can select the faces in the Mm. autofocus tracking Mm. um so depending on that possibly we do have that however what i would say is i never ever use face or head detect uh, tracking when i'm shooting weddings because i you know i'm a focus recompose shooter and i i need to have total control of, of what i'm doing at uh albert goes on to say he can shoot 6 10 20 frames per second in silence pick the best one um again you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that i don't do that i you know i i i like to think that i think about each shot rather than you know i'm not just i'm not saying that albert is doing this he, he, he quite obviously states that he could do that not necessarily that he does do that um but uh you know we feature film shooters can shoot up to i don't know what is it 18 20 24 frames per second yep. um and you know for me i kind of think personally and i don't know what you think about this that as a storyteller i like to try and think of uh, you know, constructing a story um, through the empathy of the images rather than just shooting and hoping for the best. You know, yeah. I often talk and I, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have heard me blather on about this before, but, <laughs> you know, the the idea that, if, uh, you know, I want my clients to, to look back at the pictures in 20, 30 years time and, and say, oh, do you remember when that happened rather than do you remember when the photographer made that happen? Mm. Uh, and I think that comes down a little bit to this kind of shooting technique of, um, uh, you, you know, and, and I'm only... It comes back to authenticity. Yes and no. I, I mean, yes, I agree with you. But at the same time, I don't want to say that just because this is the way that I prefer to shoot, it's it's yeah. the right way. Yeah. You know, the, everybody does things differently. Yeah. Um, but for me, on the occasions in the past where I, fi- I feel like I've shot, uh, you know, aggressively through a particular moment... It, Maybe it's just the way I look. Maybe it's my pointy eyebrows. I really don't know. But it affects the moment. I remember, People, you're only allowed to smile 35 times a month I know, as well. yeah, yeah. I've only got one left. <laughs> that could affect oh, it's how gone. people see. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, so – uh, but it does affect it. I, it people change they, – their, uh, their mannerisms change. The moment disappears. And, mm. you know, I concentrate a lot on um, trying to get emotion in pictures. And – I, I, you know, I am confident in saying if I stood there and took twenty pictures of somebody, you know, having a delicate hug, that moment would go away. You know, you it would go away, and and the thought of that moment in history never ex- existed yeah. because I went click 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 click. That that's just not good for me. Don, I remember seeing a film about Don McCullen and the way that he interacts with people when he's photographing on the uh, on the street, and he does actually ask permission uh, a lot of the time. Now that. 
I, I can't imagine he would have been doing that for some of his uh, his conflict pictures. But he seems to me somebody who makes friends with the subjects that I don't mean literally invites no, no. him around to dinner. Yeah. But it makes friends with the subjects that he he photographs as as he moves along a street and through a scene. Oh yeah, I mean from a street photo I mean listen, we I'm talking about wedding photography here and you know I my very personal um uh, take on my style of wedding photography is that it's not staged, it's can- yeah. Candid is an adjective. It's you know, it's either candid or it's not. You know, I try not within uh, an inch of my life to affect any moments to to you know to have anything um, uh, change because of my presence or my position or anything. So uh, that's just the way I. But do inevitably, things, things will change because you're there. Of course, because I am there. Yeah. You know, you only have to walk into a bridal prep room and, yeah. and things change. You it's know. the photographer. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but you know, when it comes to the actual. Uh, organic nature of the wedding i am definitely not i'm I'm allowing them i hope to uh you know to experience their wedding through pictures as it actually happened yeah. rather than any kind of diversion from that no that said uh, albert is absolutely right it is easier you know cameras are cheaper cameras are easier software is easier to use websites you can knock together in a couple of hours barriers to entry generally are easier um but no. saying that yeah you know what my car is better than the one i had in 1995 and i'm not i don't feel guilty about that that's a very good point actually we're going to stick with weddings for this one from mark peterson loving the new podcast guys and the way it's not just fuji stuff um thank you you've noticed that i'm a committed nikon nikon user uh and you'll have to drag me kicking and screaming to a nasty end before i ever decide to change so my question is more about photography than brand. What do you two do when you turn up to a wedding and you're just not feeling it? I've been shooting weddings for three years now and I'm finding sometimes that the day is, is just not right. The mood may be a bit quieter and the guest's not very animated. What do you both do at those times? Well, I go off and have a cup of tea. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, 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 we've been to those weddings. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like it's not what you see on um, uh, on blogs and websites and Instagram and everything is usually. Although I, I actually do try and blog every single wedding I photograph, but some of them are not as fizzy as That's a very know, diplomatic as, um, way of putting it. Yeah, effervescent. Let's use that rather like than fizzy. fizzy. Yeah. It's a fizzy wedding. Yeah, but some of them are, some of them aren't, you know, and that's that's just real life. But yeah. kind of goes on to what we just said about documenting things as they happen, yeah. uh, you know, in reality. Um, you know, I, I know people who, and they're open about it, so it's not a negative thing, who if things aren't rolling, they will, you know, they will say to the clients, look, let's, you know, let's play a party game or let's do, you know, and, and you know, and kind of do all that stuff. And mm. the clients are aware that's their, their style and that's absolutely right. I remember once being at a wedding and... Um, <laughs> Uh, there was a couple of videographers and um, they said to, and they were, they were good as gold throughout the day you know we had to, we, we worked really well together and um, he said to me he said what, what are you going to do at the first dance I said what do you mean he said uh, was he asking you for a dance he said, he said uh, Kev, do you fancy a dance he, he said um, well you know when uh, when because it was a summer wedding right so you know yeah. what happens in summer weddings do the first dance and then everybody, everybody goes, goes outside, outside again. Yeah, right? yeah, he said yeah. what, what do you do to stop everybody going outside yeah I was like, mm, nothing, because I'd be going outside and getting in my car and going home anyway. So, you know, once the first dance is done, he's like, what? Had you, you used up your 35 smiles? <laughs> that was it. Well done and dusted. He <laughs> said, um, what, 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 but surely, you know, you, you need to make people stay on the dance floor. Have you got a cannon, a confetti cannon or something? I was like, no, no. He said, oh, OK. And I saw this little twinkle in his eye. And he went off, and then... Uh, and he this, had one. He had a twinkle in... No, he didn't have a cannon. He had... Uh, a, no honestly this is unbelievable um the first dance finished he ripped open his uh blazer like superman oh my word on his blazer he uh, underneath his blazer he had uh three gopro cameras strapped to his body and he'd or he'd arranged with the dj to start playing some funky jumpy jumpy music yeah um and and he was on the dance floor with these uh three gopros strapped to him dancing away like a complete and utter madman yeah. with uh, you know with the hope that people would come onto the dance floor with him which they did in fairness to well him. there was only two things going to happen there number one everybody joined him number two he looked like a d- yeah. <laughs> 
both of those things happened <laughs> okay. um, but but no honestly in fairness to the guy it worked you know it absolutely right. worked but I have you thought about maybe <laughs> taking on that, <laughs> that I, approach I actually <laughs> couldn't believe what I was seeing I seriously could not believe what I was seeing yeah. um, but the fact is yeah I mean it happens you know and um, one of the things I do by the way is um, if things are running a bit slow especially kind of after the speeches before the first dance you know there's there's often an hour or two of dead time um, I give myself something to look for I give myself a theme um, mm. and you know it could be very simple it could be I don't know you know kids with glasses on or the colour red or feet you know I once did a wedding where everybody sat around see you laughed at me last week when I said I have on my list go and take a picture of old people the oldest person yeah, well, I, my little reminder list. Yeah, I know, but or diptychs it, and triptychs. I, I, I did laugh. Yeah, but yeah. it's uh, and you're doing the, it's same. the same. No, it is exactly the same thing. But it's just the way that you said old people, mm. and I'm like, how do you qualify an old person? You know, well, but <laughs> by the lines on their face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I did a wedding once where everybody just sat around a table, a bar. Yeah, and I couldn't take any pictures apart from headshots, basically. So I photographed the bottom of all their feet. Um, and there was uh, one person had two odd shoes on. There was probably six or seven no. price tags. There was plenty of <laughs> different socks and t- uh, tights that had been scagged. And I, the client didn't give the clients that, but it right. gave me something to do, you know. And um, I always go and start taking pictures of um, the landscape of the wedding. Mm. So um, and I'm not just talking about taking pictures of, of um, trees and I mean buildings, outbuildings. Yeah. Um, the five W's. That's what you... The five W's... Is that your tummy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the five W's. I'll say it again. Shall I say it again? The five W's. The five W's. <laughs> um, yeah, that helps as well. So who, why, what, where, when. You know, if, you, if you're struggling to think of a way of making a story, yeah. think of the five W's. Have you answered who, why, what, where, and when? Um, and That's worth writing down on, on... Perhaps, Mark, write that down on your sheet of paper. Who, why, what, where, Mark when. Mark Peterson, yeah. Mm, well, I have it written down in my camera bag. It's, it's there under my yeah. camera strap. Right. All the W's. I think it was one too many W's. Right, question from you. Okay, so I have... Uh, now, this is going to be my um, question of the week. So a simpler... Oh, I didn't make a, um, a jingle. I will do. I, I promise to make a jingle. Okay, a simpler strap is coming to you. Um, we should explain this just in case you weren't listening last week. Simpler straps yes. have given us um, some straps to give away to the... Um, the, the uh, we've got one each to one of our favourite questions. Or our favourite question of the week. Uh, Simpler Straps um, are a great strap company. Um, they make the. Um, I mean, I use. I've, I I have been using the Peak Design straps. Yeah. Because I like the way that you can disconnect from them from yeah. the camera very very quickly. But you do exactly the same things with Simpler Straps. Similar thing. Yep. They're not these bright gaudy coloured uh, ones. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with those. But um, they they are good, mm-hmm. good strong. Um, straps for your camera and also I really like JP who runs it you know he's a he, it's a passion for him and he's uh, he's doing a great job with those those straps very very cool little company and you can send these to anywhere you want in the world of course because last week we sent one to <laughs> Mexico where we learned to say Tijuana or Tijuana I like the way she says it better yeah and the other one went to uh, England somewhere. <laughs> no, it didn't. It went to California. Oh, it was California. Right. However, th- we're going international again this time. This time we're going to go to Finland. So I'm oh. sorry, I'm sorry, JP, if you're oh, listening God, to this. No, I'm, no idea what Finnish music would be. At uh, Simpler Straps HQ, <laughs> you okay. probably think, "Oh my word, I'm sending them all around the world." <laughs> uh, and so the question well, is a good thing because we're introducing Simpler Straps around the globe. Absolutely. Tu- no, I don't know how you pronounce this. Tuomas. Michelinian. You made it sound like a New Yorker, Tuamas. Almost definitely pronounced incorrectly. Right. Spelt T U O M A S. Tuamas. 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 M I K K O L A I N E N. Can we have a pronunciation guide, please? Tijuana. Oh, she only does Tijuana. Tuamas Michelinian. I'm going to go with that. Um, Finland, from Finland, yes. And it says, I have a question, as I'm a person with Scandinavian personalities. Mm. Whatever that means, I don't know. I like Scandinavian people. I held myself back quite some time. I don't want to bother you guys, but then I thought, why not? There is an email address for a reason. By the way, this is the thing about Scandic people. Um, They are the most polite people on the planet. Is Scandic a real word? Scandic people, yeah. If you're from the Scandic region. Nordic. 
Nordic? Scandic. Hmm, okay. yeah, have I got that wrong? I don't know. I Sorry. thought Scandic was a lorry manufacturer. That's Scania. Oh, yeah. Uh, so my question is, how do you build your confidence to be proud of your work? Be confident to charge more, say no to gigs, and to, and the list goes on. You both seem honest, humble, and you seem to have your feet on the ground. Mm. I'm, I'm afraid that if I'm too <laughs> confident, I will come across as an ass. No! Well, I can tell you, Thomas, that uh, you definitely won't come across as an ass. Um, and, you know, the question just by asking that kind of question means that you have integrity and humbleness in your humility. scandic humility, humility in your scandic uh, nature. So, um, well, I don't know. How about you, Neil? Uh, how do you become, how do you have confidence in your work, be proud of it and be confident to charge more or less? I, well, okay, I think this is a really interesting question, actually, mm -hmm. despite all the frivolity and humour around it, mm -hmm. that I spent the first five years of my photography career feeling that I was a bit of a visitor and a bit of a fraud and that someday, somehow, I might get found out. Now, um, making pictures, if you, if you think you can walk into a wedding and because I predominantly shoot weddings and every single one is going to be an absolute winner, then you're 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 just sorely mistaken. Who was it that said you'll probably only ever take a dozen or was it fifty great shots in your whole life? Famous photographer, so famous I can't remember who said Ansel it. Adams, wasn't it? <coughs> was it Ansel Adams? Was it Ansel? Wasn't it Ansel Adams said you ten thousand. I think it was Delgado as well said something mm -hmm. very very similar. But but it, I mean that's absolutely right. I mean if if I look at my website, there are particular favourites that 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 are evergreen for me, mm. and um, I, I've spent my entire um, career trying not to repeat the evergreen shots, but that's what's in the back of my mind whenever I go and shoot a wedding. I'm thinking right. I remember how the light fell for so and so and so and so and and, and I, I I kind of that that's become part of my act. I'm not sure if I'm answering this question very well. What was the, I've got, I've gone off at a complete tangent. How do you build your confidence to be proud of your work? Be confident to charge more. Say no to gigs. <laughs> Oh, it's such a difficult one, isn't it? Well, let me let me interject a little bit because um, I'm struggling. Yeah, uh, how do you build your confidence to to be proud of your work? And now I'm very happy to say that I am. Well, not happy to say, but I'm very comfortable in saying that I'm never proud of my work ever. Isn't that funny? Never. I look at it. And honestly, you can say it hand on heart. Honestly, I'm, I, just like you just said, there are a handful of images that I look at and I uh, and I think. Yeah, I really like this. By the way, I think for any clients that may be listening to this. <laughs> no, yes, absolutely. But I don't mean they're, proud they're, as in but not, I, not, uh, not, I don't mean... But I think that's, a, that's it's almost a good thing because you're, you're striving to work harder and achieve more for every single pitch you take. That's, and no artist is ever happy with him or herself. That Yeah, that's what I mean, I suppose. And I don't mean... I suppose I'm kind of blending, blurring the, the boundaries between being... Uh, cocky mm -hmm. and being comfortable mm. and this idea of being proud you know when you sit back and you kind of with a warm glow on your face and think yeah that's great i'm going to stick that on facebook and everybody's going to love it mm. um that never happens to me what happens is i look at the pictures and i think the clients will love these i'm very happy for the you know in the vast majority of the cases of the pictures i'm going to deliver to them but then i struggle with the whole sticking them in the public space okay yeah. that's what i mean by the proudness yeah. so uh because well, often a picture it's it's not complimentary sorry it, it's it's because there's no cohesive story because mm. you're putting one image up from one moment and and the, your audience are not seeing that all the moments that were around it that went to make up this stream of thinking yeah and and and, and you know what when you <sighs> you know you you know this that i uh, like i know for a fact that i get i get maybe two and a half thousand visitors to my website a day right believe it or not well that trounces on mine uh, yeah but a majority a vast majority are other photographers like a vast vast majority um and so every time and that's that's of my own making that's because of the future film stuff and you yeah. know all of the other bits and pieces i'm not i'm not complaining about that at all but i know that every time i stick a blog post online i watch my google analytics mm. and the uh, the live uh, the live stats it hits like three four hundred mm. in a couple of minutes wow so i know that that's other photographers that are that are eyeballing that's that work. a physical amount of people just tapping onto one of your pe yeah. po posts yeah one of your pieces absolutely and you know of course i'd love them all to be wedding clients but they're mm. not um and mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong i'm not you know uh, but that's the point where i'm talking about being confident and proud and, and that i struggle with that personally myself mm. quite quite substantially because it's a it's a bit like being in a goldfish bowl isn't it you know and 
uh, you know, you have to draw a fine line between if I, you know, I still work on the assumption that, or, you know, I'm, I'm the content I'm putting on my website, my wedding website, at least, is for my future clients rather than for other photographers. Um, but the fact is different. Simple as that. Um you know, and the idea to be confident to charge more and stuff, it's not about confidence when it comes to charging. It's about real life business. Sit down, write down on a piece of paper how much money you need to live off and work backwards. That's what I would do with the, the, the pricing. It, you know, if you've got a day job as well, it's slightly different. But, you know, you, you can't you can't get by. Uh, you know, if you need two thousand pound a wedding and you need to do two weddings a, a month, that's what you need. Then that, you know, the, it's not about confidence it's about economics you know yeah. and and real life and you know ultimately that goes down to business self belief is also um uh, closing yourself off from 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 the noise that's around you as well and one of the problems with social media now there's 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 so much noise everything is awesome isn't it I've just made it awesome this and awesome that. So smashed it, smashed so, it. Yeah, sometimes try not to read read too much of that. I heard a quote the uh, couple of weeks ago. I was at the FA conference. Um, I was being a, a voice um, for for the football association at their conference. Um, but there was a speaker on, and he quoted Abraham Lincoln: "Whatever you are, be a good one." And I thought that was a really good good phrase. He also said, "Be a Willy Wonka." Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool though you know whatever you are be a good one and, and yeah absolutely and work hard and you know don't look for shortcuts and good things will come your way definitely but yeah. the, the, you know the, the, uh, to, to go back to Thomas's I'm sure I'm saying it wrong but to go back to his email you know you uh, I, I once I, I have another similar story actually I know I'm rambling again um, I used to work at Microsoft a long long time ago and uh, we listened to a um, – Bill Gates came over to do the, the conference, the annual conference. They took us down to Brighton to the Grand Hotel. And yeah. Jack, Jack D was our entertainment, and he, wow. he went around all of the tables. I think I, I, I think that's where I learned my grumpiness from, specifically Jack D. <laughs> I well, love Jack I love D. him, yeah. yeah. And he came around and he sat with us all and, and, and was in character as well. It was great. Anyway, Bill Gates no, – I think it's probably how he is. That's just how he is uh, normally. Yeah. I don't think he's necessarily Bill, in character. Bill Gates said, um, you know, how can you expect – other people to be confident in yourself if you're not confident in yourself oh, sorry how can you expect other people to be confident in you if you're not confident in yourself mm. um which makes a lot of sense right um so you know confidence pride i think pride confidence ego you know there's there's an element of, of overlap there but you know the the charging more that's purely economics business yeah. has to be there is no point you know working your your nuts off and not earn enough money for it absolutely um, so there we go. So I, I do have a question. I've got, I've got, um, I've, I've introduced a new feature for a second. I don't think this is one we'll do every week, but I've got a smart aleck of the week or a smart house of the week. You ready? <laughs> Stephen Vaughan, you get the round of applause. Um, <laughs> love the show as always. Being the pedant that I am, though. Um, oh, this is referring back to when we were talking about Fox Talbot. Do you remember? Yeah, we I got said we Letch got Lade. all our details wrong. Yeah. It's Laycock, not Letch yes. Laid. And Fox I even live Talbot. right next to Laycock. Yeah. And the OIS XF lenses are eighteen to fifty-five mil, ten twenty-four, fifty to one forty, and eighty mil macro. Also one hundred to four hundred, but I don't think that you would, you would like to use that for run and gun. So you get smart out of it. But um, just file that. Yeah, we know Stephen. Obviously, he's he's one of the very capable admins <laughs> on my ex weddings Facebook group. He is so uh, well, nice guy. We feel armed enough to be able to take the yes, mickey as well. Sarah quite. Watting, thank you for your question. Very simple one. This: What do you travel with when you uh, travel for weddings abroad um, on planes? Okay, um, I suppose you're talking about stripping down your kit. What, what do you what do you take with you? We well, if I'm this going on an, before, didn't we? If I'm going on an aeroplane, <laughs> I travel with some wine and some diazepam. Is that it? Yeah. And all the cameras go in the hold. Yeah, and then I just wake up the other side <laughs> without all the worry in between. Um, in terms of, uh, I, I, do you know what? The camera bag that I take to a wedding is exactly the same as the camera bag that I would take if I were travelling abroad. Um, and recently in my trip to, to the Gambia, I, I just took, I took two, I think we, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, two X-T3 bodies, a 56 mil, a 23, a 35. I think I took the 50 as well. Yes, I did, took the 50 as well. 1024. Did I mention 1024? Definitely took that. Um, I didn't take a flash. I took my little man Frotto Lumi Muse, six lamp one, um, a couple of uh, mini clamps to put things on um, if I for, for shooting in cars. And I think that was about it, really. Yeah. Hmm. And, and, you know, 
and, that, and, and it all fitted in a bag and it came to with the laptop in it as well 8 kilograms 8.5 yeah. kilograms same job done yeah I, t- I take pretty much the same as I take to a normal wedding here but you know obviously food film stuff small light yeah yeah I mean I might take a few I might not take the the the, f- the fourth spare camera I might just take the th- you know one extra spare camera just in case but other than that we're all good to go before the Robin Revillius <coughs> interview um, then we come back and we're talking about uh, digital marketing this week um, we should do a, a few thank yous thank you very much for your uh, lovely five star reviews if you are reviewing it's always lovely obviously you've got to be authentic and leave what you really feel but for, for those of you that uh, do write some lovely stuff we thought it'd be nice to at least say thank you to you um, so we have the self-indulgent minute now um, Kev I went first last week and you, were, you, you thought that I read off far more than you did so you, are you ready you can go first this week are you ready yep let's self-indulgent go. minute minutes on the clock starts boom now okay so this is G Archer thoroughly enjoyed the first episode good discussion and excellent production quality that's Neil by the way look forward to the next one just listen to the last three uh, back to back which I think proves it's an enjoyable show uh, easy listening easy listening it's like a country <laughs> western show do, 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 do. look forward to hearing more um, that's from Alison E26 E26 thank you very much AC Slade I love these names AC Slade he's a great uh, I had Matt Jeff last week now I've got AC Slade these <laughs> guests uh, sorry these guys have a rare ability to share wisdom and keep it fresh wisdom. to a new, new photographer uh, I'm a Fuji shooter but don't be discouraged if you shoot another format it's still a fascinating podcast okay thank you Christian Friegen uh, great topics professionally and not least pro- professionality um, even if you can't pronounce stuff and um, and not least great voices I hope but I'm confident that they'll keep it up <laughs> Go on. one Z- more we got time uh, for one more ZKR Lab uh, I've been a follower of Kevin and Neil for a while but f- uh, found this amazing podcast through his YouTube channel Go on, you can read I it. really recommend Start it so they, gave gr- they give great advice uh, through an engaging conversational format Thank you very much for your reviews. They're very much appreciated. Yes, and um, do keep them coming. Yeah, we get, we'll do our self-indulgent minute every single week. Um, right. Robin Revillius. Just give us a little bit of a lowdown again. Uh, okay, one. so Robin is uh, James Revillius' wife. Um, and uh, he's uh, uh, was an amazing photographer, sadly no longer with us. Uh, documented North Devon life uh, when they moved from London. And I was lucky enough to go and interview Robin for Professional Photographer Magazine back in the day. Uh, the article, the, uh, the, uh, the interview was never used and um, because they went bust although i think they've re- resurfaced again since and uh, so yeah so this is we've uh, we've brushed the cobwebs off this is going to be uh, a short excerpt and um, we'll we'll produce a longer excerpt which uh, we'll share on breathe pictures well, his dad was a watercolorist and wood engraver mm-hmm. um we've got some those little ones over there for instance oh, right, yeah. uh and he was also a war artist, official war artist mm-hmm. and he died in iceland on active service his plane was shot down nobody knows what happened so James was three when that happened. Um, then his mother got cancer when he was about ten and died when he was eleven. Oh. So he was sort of in the wilderness really for quite a long time. And because he was good at maths, he was um, it was suggested he should train as a chartered accountant, which is probably the most unsuitable job <laughs> possible. <laughs> and he absolutely hated that. And then suddenly he just threw it all over and went to St Martin's mm-hmm. School of Art to do art. But he, he was sort of trying different si- si- styles and not happy with it. He always felt that his father's work was overshadowing him. You know, mm-hmm. Anything he did, he, he would think, oh, that's too like Eric. Uh, so, we, you know, he hadn't found his place, really. And then in 1969, that was really a seminal year for him, um, he saw the first Cartier-Bresson exhibition, V&A, a big retrospective, and that hugely impressed him. Mm-hmm. He, he'd not seen photography as an art before, I think, mm-hmm. only as a, you know, a tool. Had he been photographing at that time, or was he still... No, not well. I mean, he, he'd taken snaps on holiday, mm-hmm. but that was all. He had a camera, but, but you know, he hadn't thought of it at all in terms of composition and, and um, well, as an art, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was hugely excited by that and, and got a camera, a better camera. And then we met that same year, a couple of months later. And then he got cancer for the first time. So, you know, his life was also turned upside down. And by the time he'd recovered, we were going to be kicked out of our London flat because it was being redeveloped. 
I come from this part of the world. Oh, okay. So that's my family come, lived in the village Dalton, where we used to live, uh, actually for three hundred years. Wow! So it was my childhood home, and the, still the place I love most in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I brought him here, and my grandfather had given me a, a little cottage, tiny, tiny little cottage. And when we were kicked out of London and couldn't afford anywhere else, James said, well, let's go and live there. So we did. And when was this? This was, well, we came in 72. Okay. But um, he had no job. Mm -hmm. He hoped to find teaching, Mm -hmm. art teaching. And he went to the next door um, arts centre, the Beeford Centre, which had been started up by Dartington Trust. And... uh, hoping that they would give him some art teaching but instead the founder John Lane offered him some photography work John had had this idea of the Beeford archive Mm -hmm. as a means of recording this particular world really which was then even more old fashioned than it is Mm. now Um, and John really sort of appreciated how much it was enshrining British country traditions really yeah. uh, but obviously was going to change rapidly very soon so he wanted it recorded and he'd had a photographer doing it actually Roger Deakin you know the mm-hmm. cinematographer he'd done a bit a couple of years but he'd just gone and so John offered it to James um, James had absolutely no training for photography at all John didn't seem to think that mattered and so off he went um, and he did it for 17 years Madly, obsessively. Yeah, um, and beautifully. Go on till dusk. Well, um, as a kind of side, the um, you mentioned he um, went to the Bresson exhibition, and that was kind of his galvanising moment. Mm. Well, um, for me, it was um, seeing the film about James on, mm-hmm. um, I think it was BBC Four or something yes. like that. He had such an affection for the area and the people within it. Mm. Um, Yet, uh, which I didn't know, but you're the person who was from this area. Yes. So how did the locals, how did the farming community, how did they react to him initially and ongoing? Well, you see, I was able to give him a sort of entree because he started with the people that I'd known from childhood. Mm -hmm. So they sort of welcomed him as part of the family in a way. Uh, So it spread out from that, I would say. But it it was also James as a person. He was just incredibly good at chatting people up. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he'd, he'd accost a farmer of doing something in the field, and, and an hour later they'd be friends. Great. That's just how he was. <laughs> and he would he would literally get up in the morning, first light, and off he would go, and just come back at, at dusk. Yeah. With rolls of films. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that that was one of his ways. He he would look out for things. You know, he'd, we'd read the local papers if mm-hmm. if there was a, a fair or a. Mm-hmm. Sports Day or something, he would follow it up. And as he began to do the work, people got to know he was doing it and, and would, you know, for, ring him up and say, um, we're about to start lambing or, or yeah. we're uh, making cider with an old press, that kind of thing. Yeah. But mostly he just set out and hoped to find something. I asked somebody a couple of weeks ago to, um, a few photographers, I said to them, right, I'm going to see um, Robin. Give me one word that describes James. Now, these people all know James' work, but I've never obviously met him. And one word that came up quite often was quiet. I think from the way that he tells his stories, his stories are beautifully quiet. They don't need any narrative because all of the narrative is in the the picture. Um, Yes, it's quite a good word. And I wonder if that... Was he like that in real life? (laughs) Oh. (laughs) <laughs> he, was, he was a talker. I, I, I don't mean that he was sort of loud and rebellious, but he was a t- he was definitely a talker. He talked all the time, but he talked to anybody he met. Yeah. And he certainly he talked to his subjects while he was taking, uh, and that's why those pictures are so relaxed because yeah. um, he was chatting away, taking so, an interest, and and they didn't actually know when he was taking the picture. I don't think. Yeah. Because because you know the like is very very quiet. Mm. Did they, uh, you know, request to see the prints, and did they come and have a look at them, and did he give prints to people? He sometimes gave prints to people. Uh, he couldn't really give it to everybody. No, of course. Uh, but he'd go back and show them what he'd taken, um, mm. and he always invited them to exhibitions. Mm. When we had book launches, we invited the people in the books, and they came. You mentioned that some of these, uh, the characters, some of the subjects are still around, 
Do you see them? Do you chat to them? Do you want do. to visit yes, them? Yes, yes. Um, from time to time, certainly. I keep up with several of them. So you mentioned um, his cameras were Leicas? Yes. Well, Always? to begin with, uh, the, the, the archive was done on a Leica. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he, he went into plate cameras later on as well. Okay. But not for the archive. No. Okay. I can show you the Leica if you want to see. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It. It's worth seeing because it's very um, idiosyncratic. This is an M3. Mm. He started out with what were then modern modern lenses. Wonderful. And then these are the, the strange modifications he did. Um, uh, yes, I read about this. So he was he was modifying the lights, the shades themselves, and so as to be able to do mm. contrasure work. Uh, unfortunately, they've got wrinkled with age, so mm-hmm. they look ridiculous. But of course, they were quite sharp. These are the, the old lenses, pre-war, uh, that he came back to. To begin with, he was using modern lenses mm-hmm. and some actors, and, things, and they were coated and, and much too harsh a contrast, he felt. And so after a lot of research, he found pre-war ones that weren't. So that's El- Elmars and Hectors. But the other thing that he was... Um, auxiliary viewfinder... Are you familiar with the view? No. Strange little gizmo. Oh, okay, so he would put that on the top. And that slots on. And it it gives you... Mm -hmm. Well, for one thing, it's a much clearer image, I gather, because it doesn't have all the lines and things on it. Yeah. But but it also gives you... uh, People say it's like an artist standing back from his easel. Gives you an idea of the picture more mm. as a whole yeah, okay, yeah um, which obviously helped him with his composition mm, absolutely it's an amazing thing that he did of course there's you know there has to be economical rewards as well but in, just in terms of you know the posterity of the of the area I think it's amazing I mean, pictures but I like think, that yeah <laughs> incredible it's, it's the depth of coverage I think that makes it quite unique um, because obviously yeah, there have been other documentary projects in rural areas but not 17 year old 17 year long run yeah and also he did this other thing of copying old photos I don't know if you knew about that yeah. and when he was out and about he discovered that, that people had these boxes of old photos you know from 1900s uh, okay. of the same places wow. and the same people in some cases and um, he added that as a second string. He borrowed them and copied them. Didn't okay. keep them, he just copied them. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so the comparisons are absolutely fascinating. When you look at the, the clothes and everything that they're wearing, you, you get some real idea of the of the life, the hard-working lives. Yeah. And, and very physical. I mean, you know, no, no forklift trucks. Yeah. If you had to... And no Burberries, keep the rain out. <laughs> No, old, absolutely. Old leather boots, lace-up leather boots. He's got some kind of hessian sack wrapped yeah, around well him. Yeah, well, that was what people wore. Yeah. It was actually quite effective to keep the rain off. But from a very personal point of view, I would <coughs> love so many more people to see this type of work. And I know that lots of people do see it. In the, in the modern photography world, people tend not to see past Photoshop and you know computers and technology yes um and whilst it's a million miles away uh, you know one of the things i do with my photography is that it's all unposed it's real they're real moments and that's that's the end of it that's what i I enjoy shooting um and it seems sadly that more and more people are you know relying on technology and posing and computer filters etc and I I, you know I just I really 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 love this work and really want more people it's the whole thing about honesty isn't it you see that's really why I think he wouldn't have liked digital because a digital image can be adopted in any way you please absolutely and other bits of another picture imported um, and and it would have been absolutely against his principles (laughs) yeah but it's about integrity isn't it I mean that's the integrity in these pictures is, is just you know, integrity and humanity. Hmm. Yeah. Now those are the two words I would use to describe Absolutely. more than quiet. I mean, I think quiet is right, but, but I think those two words have a sum of up Fascinating insight into uh, James Rivelius' uh, life, uh, courtesy of his widow, Robin. What, what an honour to spend time with. Mm, absolutely with beautiful, yeah. She's yeah. a lovely lady. 
Did she, did she find it difficult clearing you out of the house? And she had to kick you out after a while. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you wanted much. to go no, around. Actually, she was, um, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a long drive. And I, if I remember rightly, she was, you know, we, we had some soup, we had some lunch, and, mm. you know, she, she was more than happy to make me dinner and everything. No way, you stayed for dinner as well? Uh, no, I didn't in the end, but she was more than happy to let me stay for dinner. But I had to get back and, you know, and just everything. So. God, I bet you'd have liked just sort of yeah. sitting down having a hot pot and talking about James a little more. The actual full-length interview is now ready, and it's on Breathe Pictures, the podcast. So you can get that on your podcast player or go to all the W's, breathepictures.com, and you'll find the, the full version of Kevin's interview with Robin Revilius on there. Questions. Time to go. Oh, before we go to the questions, a quick reminder that uh, those that are entering competitions, because we've done a few now, the answers um, and the winners will be on the website only. So go to the website which is fujicast.co.uk. www.fujicast.co. That's, yeah, that's really important, isn't it? Right, emails. Um, I'm going to make this the, the email of the week for me. Um, so this one wins the uh, the strap, the simplest strap. Um, this one is uh, from Nigel. Um, hi, I'm interested in both the XT3 and XH. I suppose you mean XH1, but I, I do not know which to go for. I like the image stabilisation of the XH1, but I prefer the looks of the X-T3. I noticed in the spec the X-T3 has uh, minus 9 to plus 9 black and white adjustment. Please can you explain what difference that feature makes? I'll let you go first on that technical bit, so thank you. Uh, Nigel, for your question. Um, okay, so the uh, plus nine, minus nine black and white uh, feature is, first of all, it only applies to your JPEGs, and ultimately it warms them up or it cools them down. Hmm. Um, I've been asking for something like this for a long time because, you know, I, I, I warm up a lot of my, my black and whites, and they've delivered. <laughs> Yeah, and um, which is great. And I haven't so, used that feature yet, and it's a really good feature. Isn't it's really it? nice. It's very, it's yeah. quite aggressive at the higher end. Um, yeah. So plus nine is basically orange. Right, um, okay. Minus nine is basically blue. Right. Um, so it's kind of sepia down to selenium. So what have you used? Pl- plus I normally three, go for plus four. one or two. Oh, really? Yeah, that low? Okay. Subtle, it makes yeah. a lot of difference straight away. Yeah, it? it's very subtle. But it's JPEG only, and you know what? It's it's a nice thing to have for me, especially because I do that, but it's nothing you couldn't do in um, uh, mm. Lightroom or something in post-production, warming up a, a split tone or something like that. We'll deal with it. Um, so, yeah, if that's that's it Nigel for me the choice between X-T3 and X-H1 would come down to whether you think the image um, stabilisation is important if IBIS is important to you then it's got to be the X-H1 but that would for me be the only reason you would possibly want to buy this camera or maybe if you like the grip some people like like the grip of the X-H1 a bit more don't they yeah I think a bit more substantial I suppose I think bit, for bit, the people slightly heavier but not much people who you know wanted a, a DSLR style mm. camera the X-H1 is good for them yeah for sure yeah but, it, but if you're looking at um, the 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 internal workings of the camera it's got to be the xt3 romping home all the way isn't it really yeah with the exception yeah. of the ibis i would say so yeah and and i'm not sure um and we've, again we said this last week whether the the stabilization is that much of an issue when you look at the what's what's particularly in at the moment in terms of filming style and character of of um of what you see on on the screen mm. on the small screen and the big screen in that things are a lot more shaky aren't they i use um i've, I've thought of the do you remember i talked about the steering wheel mm-hmm. The Manfrotto steering wheel is called a fig rig. Um, so if you put your camera in this this large steering wheel fig rig, um, then that's a really really good way of, uh, of, of 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 promoting movement within your films if you're using it for filming. Um, fig rig, yeah, fig rig. I don't know why it's called a fig rig. I don't know, but there we go. So thank you very much, and the strap, Nigel, goes to you. Boom. Um, this week we're talking a little bit about uh, digital marketing. Um, you used to run SEO courses. You don't do them so much, but you still do workshops on them and one-to-ones from from time to time, don't you? Yeah, yeah, essentially. But, um, I mean, my background originally, before I became a photographer, was in online marketing and websites and everything. And, and of course, that was a long time ago, and it's changed dramatically since. But the fact is... You know, as wedding photographers, photographers of any genre, we yeah. need to be all over that kind of element of digital marketing, or we at least need somebody to be all over it for us, yeah. one way or the other. Um, you know, websites, Instagram, Facebook, all of that kind of stuff, and it, it, it becomes a bit of a chore, um, but it's necessary, you know, very necessary, especially things like Instagram and stuff. I mean, you, your Instagram's pretty good. 
you yeah but you know i feel um, you know i'm not sure whether to say this or not because uh, but let, let's come clear with this um because we go back to that no uh, the, the finnish chap wasn't it earlier was he f- uh, finnish y- yes um talk, talk, the, and we were talking about integrity look integrity is important to us on this show and we will do our best always to answer your questions um with truth uh, integrity um and be absolutely honest with you and kevin's just asked me a question about the fact that my instagram does quite like, well, yeah, if you look at the, the amount of subscribers on there, yes, it does. But you look at the amount of engagement on there, does it match the subscribers? No, it doesn't. And I think one of the reasons for that is in the very early days, a marketing agency, um, um, were, were, I employed a marketing agency to help me look after my Instagram feed. And I'll tell you why I did that, because I had no time to do everything. Mm-hmm. I was shooting 60, 70 um, weddings a year. And the idea of, of being, um, you know, in, in front of Instagram, in front of Facebook, in front of Twitter, just, you know, at some stage, something just had to give. And for me, Instagram was one of those things. And so, therefore, I don't think the figures have really ever reflected what the what the what the what the, the, the true numbers are. No, does that, that make sense? Yeah, that makes absolute sense. And it's it's so. And that's one thing we're saying you should never do. Absolutely. And I did it years ago. Yeah, and and I put my hand up. I know loads of people have done it. And from a branding point of view, you know, it makes sense. You you do want your business to look bigger and popular and more popular, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's you, you know you've got to counterweigh that with the the fact that especially on things like Instagram and it, even people who used to buy links for their website and everything, yeah. it it's counterproductive. Fortunately, because I never did that. The algorithms get you in the end. You know, yeah. I, I mean. Google used to um, publish things not to do. It's, you know, there's like a whole list of things you should not do. Uh, one of those things was kind of cloaking, uh, you know, hiding, uh, uh, hiding keywords on the page with the same color background. Link stuffing, but link stuffing, buy-in links, yep. and you know the reason why they used to say don't do these things was because it actually worked. You know, otherwise, why would they ask you not to do it? And it worked. And and a lot of the marketing agencies back in the day, at least, did it because it was a very quick way. You know, they'd ring you up, say, hey, we can get you on um, page one of Google within a week. Oh, that sounds great. Give me 500 pounds. Give you 500 pounds. They stuff your your website with a load of stuff that are bad stuff. It gets to page one on Google. They run off with your one, your 500 pounds. And then Google finally re-index and you, 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 know, you get penalized. And, and like I said, the reason why Google uh, said don't do these things was because it was working. And they always said way, way back in the day that we are migrate. We are making the algorithm to be very, very capable. And if you keep doing these things, you, you know you will be penalised eventually. And they had penguin updates and panda updates, and then they, you know, then then they started doing the link disavow or the opportunity to to check your backlinks and make sure they're not stuffed or um, purchased or negative links. Um, you know, and it's caught a lot of people. I know. Uh, well, I I could name three wedding photographers who basically cheated their way up the rankings and then ended up going out of business because they wow. their website just got no deleted yeah. like literally overnight boom yeah. gone switched off yeah so you know the message on, on that is you know just play by the rules be uh, yeah it's, we we say it uh, so many times just honestly work hard you know uh, the simple thing with the website and instagram authentic content original content regular content you know don't especially when it comes to you know how many times have we seen blog posts where it's it's clearly written for google you know Mm. um don't just just write it for the viewer the human treat google as another human with respect on the instagram um topic is there something to be said for sticking very rigidly to to a theme rather than okay i'll put a few pictures up of the kids and i'll put some pictures up of weddings and i'll have a black and white then i'll have a full color then i'll have a portrait then i'll have a reporter a reportage picture well put it this way if uh if i were coca-cola then i would be very rigid with my uh content However, I'm not Coca-Cola. I'm a little bloke that photographs weddings and people that want wedding photographers like personality and and to understand who's working for them and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm happy to stick pictures of the the kids and stuff occasionally, not all the time. Um, And in fact, the pictures of the dogs and the kids usually get more likes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think, you know, just be just have it as a personality. You know, one of the... 
one of the things that people often get wrong i think on instagram is uh especially on instagram is not you know they they replace the word social in social media with a guerrilla marketing like social the word social is there for a reason it yeah. should be social it should be social engagement it should be uh you know interacting uh, you know they sticking a, a picture up and then sticking 50 hashtags to me when a client sees that you know is going to look at that and think well, i don't you know because they don't understand a bit marketing and stuff mm. or what you're trying to do they just see noise 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 um you know keep be, be sensible with the hashtags be conversational with the, the content you put on there ask questions answer the questions that will drive traffic to the post and and you know therefore be a conduit to the website and, and what about text on instagram post now my, my cousin um my cousin vicky <laughs> sounds like the start of a song doesn't it my cousin vicky what was that song what was that my cousin is it country and western Ooh, no it was not country and western. don't know then no mind okay um, my cuz, my cuz, uh, Vicky has a really successful um, Instagram channel, which is built from zero to I don't know where it is now, but it's tens and tens of thousands. It's called in no particular order, Inpo, and she's character she, all her she's characterised all, all her family. So there's Mister Inpo, and then there's the little Inpos that go with it. <laughs> Brilliant. It sounds like something of a Willy Wonka um, <laughs> film, but. Um, she she writes huge long pieces to go with with each of her pictures, uh-huh. talking about her life. Um, she talks a lot about um, being um, larger size, and to her credit, that's that's done an awful lot of good for her. Absolutely. Um, so, do we have to write? diatribes along with our instagram pictures not, not diatribes but if you enjoy writing about your pictures and you enjoy enjoy um communicating with the people that are enjoying your pictures yep. then then do that i always write um usually two or three paragraphs um it's not just remember like i said it's remember the word social yeah okay don't lose fact or don't lose sight of the fact that it's social media and that does not mean one way yeah. So one way aggressive marketing is advertising. Okay, there's a difference between advertising and social media. So uh, I think Impo you called it Impo I N P O in no particular order in no particular Impo, order. Yeah, that sounds great. And you know, you the the thing about Instagram is that often people just scroll up their feed and they double tap and you yeah. like something or other. They're not necessarily going to read the the things. However, on you know, I I when i put stuff on mine i know people read it because they answer they reply to things that I've, I've written in the text um you know and instagram will undoubtedly kind of like the fact that you are interacting yeah you know, without a doubt oh that's really important actually getting back to people isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I didn't get back to people at all i was thinking oh it's enough with the email and the facebook mm. and the twitter and mm. no more but I, I i try and get back to every single but the algorithms right. will be all over that as well. So, you know, just simply replying with a, a smiley face or, a, you know, whatever isn't going to cut it. You know, no. remember the, the these algorithms are now are so sophisticated. Do algorithms take note of, of you, comments? You can't. I would imagine so. Yeah. So? Yeah. I mean, I don't oh, know for sure. I okay. think the, the Google algorithms have changed substantially, but it's it's going to be based on the same kind of principles. And yeah. absolutely the content, the textual content, the message, the uh, the organic nature of it is super important. You know. Okay, so that that's Instagram. What about YouTube? How important is YouTube in all this? Well, YouTube is uh, it's the second. I think after Google itself is the second most popular search yeah. platform on the planet. Um, however, I, I mean, you and I have spoke about this before. You know, using YouTube as a way of marketing towards wedding clients. Yes. And I tried it. I set up a second, a separate web, um, YouTube channel, which was going to be just my photo films. Yeah. And, you know, with a view to thinking that, that clients will go to that. But when I was looking at the analytics of that channel, nobody seemed to go to Google and type in things like wedding photos at such and such a venue. Yeah. Uh, sorry, not Google, uh, YouTube. YouTube. Nobody is going to go to YouTube or nobody has been going to YouTube and typing in things like wedding photographer at Wazing Park, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What they type into things in YouTube is, you know, uh, how do I fix my boiler? Um, what's the difference between a Sony RX whatever and a Fujifilm X-T3? It's a very, very different interface, I think. Um, and certainly that's what I've seen. However, 
That said, I have definitely had bookings, wedding bookings from people who have stumbled across my channel. Um, and often, not often, but some of them have been wedding photographers themselves. But, you know, it, it it's there. It's in the mix. But I, I feel, I don't know. I mean, we should ask the listeners this. How many people would, uh, you know, you do you think that people would go to YouTube to look for something as personal as that? You know, they go for reviews yeah. and they go for technical stuff and they go for entertainment. Are they likely to go to YouTube and search for a wedding photographer? Wedding photographers. No, maybe not. You know, I think it's a different dynamic. Do you think they might search for wedding ideas? Yeah, wedding ideas, um, that kind of stuff for sure. Let's see what comes up if I if I wedding ideas. See which suggestions come up. 17 awesome wedding ideas. Well, Sorry, I can't use the word look, awesome. Interestingly, when you typed in wedding idea, as soon as you started typing, it comes up yeah. in the in the search box with um, the most searched for yeah, things. Look at that. Wedding, wedding ideas, ideas on a budget. On a budget. Yeah, yeah. Wedding ideas for reception. Yeah. Wedding ideas direct de- decorations. decorations. Wedding ideas for ceremony. So let's type in wedding P. Okay, so. Wedding photography. Wedding photography. Wedding P H O. Let's see what photography animation is, is top of the moment. Wedding photography animation is top. Then we do have wedding photography tips, tutorial poses. These are what other photographers are searching for. Yeah. Um, so these are more for photographers than ever they are for absolutely for brides and grooms. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. these are search predictions based. On, and and actually the same thing is true in Google. If you go to Google.co.uk or Google.com and you just start typing in. Yeah. It's going to give you the, um, the thing that most people search for. So if, for example, you're doing a blog post about a wedding venue yeah. and you type in, uh, let's say, Wazing Park, um, you know, you type in Wazing Park space, then what it's going to predict for you is the, is the top search terms. Yeah. So it could be prices or it could be yeah. um, you know, fares or whatever. Um, so you can use that to, to kind of indicate, to look at what people are searching for. So in, in terms of YouTube, then no. Facebook. Uh, Facebook, I still use, but I use it as a absolutely as a conduit to my website. Yeah. So every time I do a blog post, and again, it's difficult for me because uh, you know I, I do have this this kind of skewed following of um, you know from the feature film stuff and everything. So yeah, yeah um, which is great. I'm not you know I'm definitely not not kind of knocking it, but um, you know. So f- uh, Facebook for me is the business page at least still exists and still, you know, I still get good engagement. You know, everybody for the last kind of two years and we say, oh, you know, Facebook, you get you get like a reach of 100 or something. Um, and again, I feel that that's possibly the ones that have tried to mismanage the Facebook content, perhaps. Have you noticed how people are putting more films on Facebook and making it far more personal? Well, what Facebook did last year was, you know, up until then, you could upload a link to YouTube and or Vimeo and it would play the YouTube or video uh, Vimeo uh, video in Facebook. That's not easy to say that. <laughs> um, but now they to discourage you from doing that no longer happens. So it, it will create a link that you then have to go through to YouTube to play wow. it. So what they want is for you to upload your video to to Facebook of itself. They do. But the um, quality is always n- not as good, is it's it? It's not as bad as it used to be is because they, they've right. got this idea of Facebook TV coming up now, haven't they? Uh, and yeah. you, they've already, in a, I think, certainly in America, they are, um, you know, they're, they're premiering films and mm. sports events on Facebook. You know, kind of h- trying to hit the Netflix market. So um, yeah, well, you know. Whatever. I think Facebook personally is still very viable. Um, it works. I still get good reach on my uh, on posts that I'm not sponsoring. I'm not kind of promoting uh, financially. Um, it always drives good footfall to my website, but with that little caveat that I'm not sure how many of those are uh, are yeah. photographers or not. Um, okay. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter. I struggle with Twitter <coughs> in terms of of how it works with my business well i think if you look at all of these platforms you should try and identify whether they are their relationship between the business and the consumer right so i see instagram very much as a business to consumer platform and twitter very much as a business to business platform like linkedin yeah yeah like linkedin um and so twitter i don't necessarily expect nor do i use for trying to get brides and grooms to book my weddings Mm. 
Um, I use it to, uh, you know, to to mix with other clients, other venues, um, you know, my brands, the, the brands that I'm associated with, um, you know, news, all of that, all of that kind of stuff. And in turn, that drives things like my workshops and stuff, you know, mm. so that, there's that business to business relationship. Um, for a while, it was said that Google would actually look at things like your Twitter account, follow account, um, and that would be part of your authenticity, uh, your authority, which they later kind of degraded. But, um, you know, and that would help your ranking so having a larger twitter following um potentially helped your general organic search rankings and the only way you're going to do that unless you cheat and buy them is to uh, put good honest content out there share other people's content uh, you know if ever i stumble across a photography article that i'm interested in uh, on the bbc for example i'll always share it on twitter because yeah. then other people might and in turn they will that might drive followers up etc cetera, etc cetera. good practice then yeah but it's business to business i think twitter rather than uh, business to consumer. Uh, anything we've left out here? Any platforms we've? Uh, there's hundreds, isn't there? There's Pinterest. Yeah. Oh God. Pinterest, yeah. however you want to call it. Yeah. Um, now Pinterest is the one that drives most traffic to my website than anywhere else. But I don't have a Pinterest account. I don't have one. Um, I don't use it. However, Pe- people have pinned your people pictures, pinned your content. Yes, yes. that's so, why it's so important to have Pinterest very, opportunity, whatever kind of photographer. Very important, are. and and little things like a lot of people use. I think it's called Blog Stomp on their website yeah. for um, uh, you know putting their their blog pictures on there, and that 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 collates three or four images into one JPEG right. on the blog post. Yeah. Um, now that kind of thing is less likely to be shared on Pinterest than an individual image. So, you know, think thinking a little bit strategically about that kind of concept, you know, helps you get stuff mm. pushed forward a little bit more. Um, you know, I'm not saying you should all stop using blog stomp of course, because it has a lot of benefits, but just, you know, if you look at the content that's on Pinterest, usually it's single images rather than collages. Um, now Pinterest, I said it's it's the best social media platform because I have zero zero effort yeah. and most traffic. Yeah. But I guarantee that's the same for almost everybody. Yeah. You know, as long as you don't block. I mean, do you remember we had that conversation with um, uh, was it Jeff Jeff Askoff? I think at one of his workshops where he you know he didn't want Pinterest to be able to. Um, oh, yes, you're right. I'm yeah. sure it was him, but yeah. apologies if it wasn't. Um, where he he wanted to block Pinterest from being able to share his images. Now, in, in defence of Jeff, that was right at the very beginning of the Pinterest thing. Um, people didn't quite understand what it was, and, and also at a time where, where a lot of photographers didn't actually want to give digital images to people as well. True. Um, so, so things have changed a lot. Absolutely, but but people still do block it. You can block it quite simply, um, and. But in a visual world, that's that's crazy. You know, that's crazy. Um, but yeah, there's there's all kinds in there. There is LinkedIn. There's uh, to me, Instagram is the key one though. Okay. Um, social media is something. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at the, the the clock on the wall here and, and seeing how much we've, or mainly you have said about about this subject. If 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 there's any particular direction you you would like to take the social media um, and digital marketing chat, then um, email us. So the best best thing to do is click at fujicast.co.uk. Yeah. Uh, be very specific about the direction you would like that chat to go in, and uh, we can we can do that as a question or maybe a whole topic on the show. But Talk- n- never forget the word social in social, social media. In social media. I won't forget. Don't that. be an aggressive guerrilla no, marketer. No. Right. Talking of topics, next week. Kind of similar, really. We, we, I guess we're remaining within digital marketing to an extent, where we're going to be talking about the currency of likes and how to deal with um, the negativity as well. Mm-hmm. Online negativity. On, online especially. negativity. Mm. Because you will get it. And um, and, and it's, it's part and parcel, I'm afraid, part of the course of, of, of um, the digital world that we, we now live in. So we thought we'd tackle that as a subject next mm-hmm. week sound like a good one yeah it does indeed and don't forget we uh, would love your questions still um, we do have a whole load of questions um, and we are slowly working through them so uh, you know if we haven't got to yours uh, yet don't worry but please send them through for anything including social media weddings street photography Fujifilm specific stuff I don't think either of us are capable of answering anything to do with uh, Sony or anything but yeah. we were you know we, we, we were both DSLR users in the past um, general stuff 
life photography just uh, please yeah. do yeah that's really really important that's the lifeblood of the show are your, are leave your us questions. a review leave us oh, a oh yes review. leave a review leave that's a review I'm psychologically whispering <laughs> leave us a review is that yeah what was that thing that they used to flash on screens that used to be like a, um, a, a fraction of a second Remember that? that yeah. Was, that was that, that kind of... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. illegal on television now. You're yeah. not allowed to do it. Yeah. But is the whispering a version of that? Leave a review. Is whispering a version of that? Leave a review. <laughs> leave a review. Leave a review. <laughs> All right. Uh, payoffs. Leave a review. Uh, payoffs this week come from... Uh, well, from Rosa, first of all, for, for, for her dad, Kev. My dad's Instagram is Kevin Mullins Photography. See his films on YouTube at Documentary I. His website is kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk or for street workshops, training and everything Fujifilm, go to f16.click. Leave a review. Mine's from Thomas. My dad's Instagram is Neil James. See his films on YouTube at Neil James Photo. His website is neiljames.com for pictures and one-to-one mentoring. And you can hear his other photography podcast, which is called Breathe Pictures, wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, and don't forget his name is spelled N. E-A-L-E We will see you next week Thank you very much uh, Thank you so much to Simpler Straps for their support Oh yes, Simpler Straps Leave a review Leave a review Leave a review Leave a review Leave a review